Hello and welcome to the Home Base Podcast. I'm Valerie Kaya. Today, for our very first episode, I'm joined by founder and principal investigator of Home Base, Dr. Richard Hovey, um, who is also an associate professor in the Oral Health and Society Division of the Faculty of Dentistry at McGill. Hello, Dr. Hovey. Thank you for being here. Hello, nice to be here. I want to jump right in. This is a very exciting project that has quite an interesting history in the way that it, it has come to be. Let's start from the beginning. So you're a qualitative researcher in the faculty of dentistry, and for years you've researched pain in other people, obviously, but few researchers have perhaps ended up gaining the kind of perspective about their own research that you were afforded through your experience. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Um, <clears throat> so as, as you mentioned, I was doing research uh, basically around suffering, which included pain. It also included preventable medical error, uh, diabetes, um, osteoporosis. And, and I got to know people quite well who were living with these conditions, but none of which I had at that point. So I'm always looking at it from the perspective of somebody who thinks they understand what it means to live with complicated health issues. And, and I thought I was doing a very good job until um, after a cycling accident, um, I was left several months later uh, in my own extreme pain that went from acute to chronic over a period of several months, and now it's been well over three years since I've been living with the pain. And, and it was at that point where I started to really understand what it meant to live with chronic pain. My first couple of years with it were... Uh, dramatically life-changing. I, I, I wasn't sleeping very much. It was hard to concentrate. Um, you get very, very despondent over the fact that you can't do things the way you used to do. And, and you look fine. Um, so you get a lot of this sort of idea that, well, you know, you're not limping anymore or this is not going on, but the pain is always there. Now, the interesting thing to me was that um, I finally got up the courage to go to a pain support group meeting and went there not as a researcher for a change, but as a person living with their own pain. And I was very intrigued by the dynamic of what was happening in there and, and, and how people looked out for each other and how people supported each other. Um, and and un unconditionally, it was, it, was, it was a wonderful experience. But I also noticed that there were very few men participating in these uh, pain support groups. And, and I asked about that, and they said, well, you know, we get, we get three or four out of, you know, maybe 20, 25 people, and, you know, they consider that to be pretty good. And I said, well, where are they? And they go, we don't know. They just don't seem to come to pain support group meetings. So I thought to myself, there must be something else going on, because where are these men if they're not here? Or, or do they have something else that's going on that I don't know about? And I, I thought that I did. So what I did was, was I started to uh, listen very carefully to the men who were there about their experiences, about the gaps in health care, and, 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 and the lack of understanding of masculinity as an encultured way of being in our world. And, and, and to do that, you know, the, the idea of a, of a support group um, was not quite addressing the ideals of masculinity, of, of what it means to be a man, and, and to uh, how men like to communicate and, and do activities together. So I, I, I was thinking about that when out of uh, my email comes something from Movember, the Canadian Movember Foundation, who had a call for funding, a uh, pilot project, looking at how to reduce social isolation for men in, in, any, in any way or form. And I just thought about the chronic pain. For people to overcome this huge energy gap and this huge isolation gap, that we needed to do something a little bit differently. So uh, having a background in philosophical hermeneutics, which is a way of understanding complex thinking, complex uh, experiences, I put together an abstract for the Movember Foundation, and uh, apparently they received 440, and, and 80 were uh, moved to the second level, which was um, a pitch, which was a three-minute video and a 1,500-word uh, written uh, pitch or proposal. And we sent that in, and then we became one of 25 to get funding to design the the pilot project. Now, the interesting thing about all this, it's not like I'm a healthcare provider who then did all this and invited the men into it afterwards as patients. They were the group that basically worked with me brainstorming and discussing and conversing over what was missing 
in their experiences as men as they work through the healthcare system and what they're left with. And, and essentially, the healthcare system does their absolute best to help people, but it's, it's overburdened and it, and it has limitations for funding and, and, and other, kinds of, um, other kinds of programs. So, so what we did was we, we, th- we thought about what would be interesting for men to do, and we had um, this idea of home base. And, and of course, home base has the uh, metaphor of a, of a of baseball. Or, and and all, most of us as kids growing up played baseball, or at least we understood what baseball was. And we have, you know, the, the things in our language like, I'll touch base, base with you later. But also home. We wanted something, we wanted a name where people would say, I, I, I'm, I'm going to be safe here. I'm going to do stuff that's going to help me transition. So this project is built around the topic of chronic pain. Mm -hmm. Chronic pain is a very complex theme in itself, but it also touches upon isolation, Mm -hmm. even more so uh, than just the chronic pain. Why is isolation so important? Why is it so important to address that? Well, isolation um, leads to potentially loneliness, and uh, recently I've seen in, in the news and a lot of um, research is, is saying that isolation is a, is a very important risk, health risk factor. So isolation uh, means that you have, with nobody to talk to, it, it's almost like being incarcerated in your own pain. And this incarceration means that you withdraw more and more and more to the point where you may become despondent, you may become anxious, you may become depressed. And those without purpose, without any sense of, of, of identity, um, may be a reason why uh, the suicide rates for men are higher, especially living with pain, than in, in other contexts. So it can be a very serious problem for men who isolate themselves. And again, without the sense of purpose, not only purpose for themselves, but purpose for others, because we want to give back. Mm -hmm. And nothing makes us feel better than giving back to our communities or to others. And so if you're helping another man trying to deal with his chronic pain, at the same time you're working in the community, all of a sudden you've repurposed yourself Mm -hmm. and you've restored yourself to a point where you now have something that's meaningful to do because you are helping again. Can you talk a little bit about this um, idea of restoring? Because... If we go back to your own, your own story, can you lead us through this in a little bit more detail? Um, you had this happen to you, you went into acute pain, which turned into chronic pain. That's a process in itself. But what, what was the transformation like, that, that transition from your old self to your new self? What was that like? Well, I think what I experienced, and I've, you know, my research has always pointed out that I mean, people go through a transformational process, and the first one, of course, is accepting that this is something that's permanent, most likely. Mm-hmm. And, and with that acceptance, you, you begin the possibility of, to restore yourself. Mm-hmm. Now, restoring comes out of, uh, of a philosopher's perspective on how we need to narrate our chronic conditions. And this is not in a therapeutic context specifically, but it's in the context of, of how to uh, start to rethink about, or how to, how to reconceptualize yourself in the world. Mm-hmm. And so, so in that, when, you know, when you're doing this, is that you're caught in between. You're caught in between who you were and, and our identities by the time we get into our late 20s and 30s are, are closely related to our jobs, what we do, how people see us. And then pain comes into the picture, and all of a sudden that all sorts... That, that all sort of dwindles away to you're left with um, a shell, if you want, of who you used to be. And, and so you don't know transformatively how to go forward. At the same time, you can't go back to who you are. So this is when you, you literally or maybe metaphorically sit in your damp basement not wanting to do anything because you, you just don't have the energy. You're, you're, you're anxious. You're apprehensive. I mean, all these emotions that kind of paralyze us sort of come into place. So what we, what we do find that um, even uh, as I as I worked with these men, is that as this project gave them purpose and gave them identity, they, they started to become way more engaged in challenging their pain and what they could do. So even in, in, in the most uh, simplistic terms, when we restore people by having them start to think about who they are and who they could be living with pain, it kind of changes the dynamics that you now have a more, uh, you have a more positive outlook, but also you begin to imagine again. Because you lose your imagination when you're in pain, because you can't imagine your life or doing anything in pain. So giving people back choice, imagination, uh, reflections on your self-humility, your commitment to what you want to do, discernment that you don't make a decision that you're not ready for, and, and lastly, hospitality, to welcome everything that comes in. 
even if it's negative, because negative information also tells us something about the direction we should take next. You're talking about welcoming, you're talking about accepting. Some people, as they're listening to this, might be thinking, well, is accepting like giving up? It's a bit, is, is it like quitting? Just saying, well, it's never going to change? What's, what's the distinction between it, it's It's kind of like turning it around. It's, really, it, it, it's the same as saying, you know, we, we use the word surrender, and, and, and surrender has a very negative term. But if we surrender into something, it just means that we accept it as being part of my life. Mm -hmm. And so if, if I can accept it, and I can now put it behind me rather than it leading me all the time, then, then, then the pain has to follow me in my direction. It's going to constantly remind me that it's there, but now I'm in charge of my pain rather than in charge of me. And, and it's, it's a reversal. And I think that's, that's very important. And I, I think the whole idea of transformation is coming to the realization that once I surrender into it, then the idea of me doing something about it with others, you can't, you can't necessarily do it by yourself. You need to get these out with others to discuss and to explore and to imagine. Then, then to be quite honest, something magical happens. Mm -hmm. And we're not really trained in our lives to do this. But it's interesting because adult learning theory has transformational learning theory, which is about exactly that and how adults cycle through basically a, a, a shattering or a disorientating dilemma that, that, that turns their life upside down. And then the idea of being in the, that middle part, where you call it surrendering or if you call it accepting, is coming to an understanding of, of what you need to do and how to do it. And, and finally, you, you move into what I call the dance, where you know you, you, your dance partner is always pain, but you're leading it most of the time rather than it leading you. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask you, before this event took place in your life, what led you to research what you research? And then, how did your perspective on that change once it was so close to you yeah. in your life? Well, it started out, I mean, I, I, I go back to the first event in my life where I was, uh, I was, uh, not the very first, uh, when I was at the, uh, I, was in, I was living in Regina and I was part of a uh, community uh, program. And we're looking at food baskets and why people were throwing f stuff out of the food baskets. And, and, and it was interesting because the default was that, oh, why are they doing that? They're not appreciative. And, and so I, I wondered about that. And I sort of said, well, has, has anybody ever asked people why they throw things away? And, and they said, well, no, uh, we, we never thought about doing that. So I went out, and, and when the food's been delivered, and I said, excuse me, I don't mean any offense by this, but why are you throwing that away? Well, we don't know what it is. It doesn't taste good to us, mm -hmm. or we don't know how to prepare it. So there was my first introduction, unknowingly, into qualitative research and, and its implications for change. And we devised a program that then would help with the, take the baskets with the people who are coming in, with nutritionists, into a, a cooking environment, and they, we would cook food that tasted good to mm -hmm. them, but doing it in a more nutritious way. And so that spawned my thinking that understanding complex human interactions often starts with a simple question, why? And, and so when I went, when I finally was working my PhD, I did it on the meaning of living with osteoporosis. And I, I, was, I was a man who was not living with osteoporosis. But what I heard from people uh, during my time uh, in, in different boards of directors and stuff was the, the, the idea of loss. You know, literally a loss of bone, but also a loss of life and not death, but life. You know, I used to do this, now I can't do it. And, you know, and, and then I started to hear these, these, these healing stories of, of people been, who, who work through all these different challenges. And I understood that from an, ap from an absolute perspective, sometimes loss is something we can share an understanding in. But, but each loss is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And so as I started to move my research agenda along, it became about suffering. And what I've learned about suffering is that I may not be able to change the, the chronic condition, but we can mitigate suffering mm -hmm. by giving people opportunities to restore or restore themselves. Mm -hmm. Speaking of restoring, it was a necessary step for you in terms of um, attending support groups yourself. Mm -hmm. what, what allowed you or enabled you to, to finally take that step? Because it must have been new territory for you. Also, you're, you're wearing this researcher hat all these years, and now you have this accident happen, and you have to, I guess, adopt a different perspective on it to be able to create change in your life. Yeah, I, I, and that's a, you know, that to me was one of the most, um, most um, awareness mm -hmm. ev events in my life, and, and I realized that, you know, what we do as researchers and clinicians and other types of researchers is that we approach many things from a theoretical 
biomedical construct. So by not living with pain, and I'm interested in pain as a clinician, I learn about all the different ways to treat pain. I, and, and maybe as, as, a, as a therapist, I learn all the ways to help people who are going through depression and stuff. But that's quite different from the person who ends up in pain because they are unwilling and unsuspecting victims of that pain. And so the interesting thing is that they have the lived experience of pain, and they work through it, and they try to do their best, but then they meet somewhere in the middle. It's kind of like a bow tie, where they come into the middle into the knot. And then you have these different narratives that compete with each other. So on one side, the, the brevity of healthcare wants uh, Likert scales of 1 to 10 and intensity of pain, whereas you have a story about how pain has changed your relationship with your children or grandchildren, how it's changed your relationship at work, or you've lost a work. And somehow in there, there's this competing narrative or lack of narrative that, that we're, trying to, um, we're trying to identify as being more important or as important as the cure itself. Mm -hmm. And so the idea then is, you know, we, we, as healthcare tries to anesthetize pain, we want pain to speak. And since it's not always practical in a, in a busy healthcare clinical situation, we want to offer those opportunities in the community where I'm no longer Richard the patient, I'm just Richard at the YMCA or I'm Richard at some other event. Mm -hmm. And that helps me to restore myself as a, as a person, not as a patient. Because after all, only occasionally a patient, but always a person. Mm -hmm. Can you walk us through in detail through the event that happened to you and... Um, how challenging that was because you had the accident and then you had to understand what was happening to you and then you sought help. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a whole trajectory through the healthcare system as well. But can you just speak about how you, you yeah. felt through, through that as you were trying to make sense of what was happening to you and as your life was changing? Well, in, in the, way we, the way we define pain is that it's acute pain mm -hmm. depending on who you read from three to six mm -hmm. months. And, and what happens is, is that your experience of pain for most people is one where you have an event and the event gets taken care of. So let's say, for example, you had a, a you broke your arm and, mm -hmm. and you had a cast on it and six weeks later or less the cast's off, you have a little bit of tenderness, but then, you know, a couple months later you're going, I don't even feel this anymore. So, so we have in our, in our mind a model of healing that is absolute, that it gets to the point where it goes away or it's so negligible it doesn't really, really change. It's about fixing something. About fixing, mm -hmm. right? So, so, you know, you, and so in that model, when you first have a, a chronic pain episode, and for me, it was uh, after my cycling accident, I was, I, I was rehabbing from that quite successfully. And I, and I played tennis one evening, and, and after the tennis, and nothing happened there, I went home, and I went to bed, and I woke up um, thinking I was in a nightmare of the worst pain I'd ever experienced in my life, and then I realized I wasn't sleeping, and I had the pain shooting down into my foot every 10 seconds, and uh, cramps, and my back was just radiating. It's sort of like somebody who was, uh, had electrodes they were placing onto my back, and on my foot, it was numb and painful at the same time, and I told people, sort of like pouring boiling water on it all the time. And so it was like somebody following me with my foot bare, and they were just pouring water on it all the time, and I remember sitting in the back porch, uh, and just you know, relaxing, and a fly landed on my foot, on the top of my foot, and I jumped like somebody had dropped, like a, a brick. Mm -hmm. And uh, I realized then that this was, this was something different. I also looked at my, uh, my insurance, and uh, for the first year and a half, when I got my insurance um, uh, summaries, I had like five pages of, of uh, physiotherapists and, and osteopaths and, and everybody else, and, and I, had, uh, uh, I had MRIs, and I had... Um, I had, uh, you know, massage therapists, and I had uh, nerve block injections, and, and you know, all sorts of things. And I realized that, you know, this all took place within the first three to four months. I was completely consumed by getting rid of the pain, and I was completely engulfed in the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. The next person will help me, the next person, the next opinion. And then you start to realize that after a while, that after you get to about six, seven months, that, okay, this isn't really... I'm, I'm now being told... Um, quite sympathetically, that there's nothing else I can do for you. Um, and then my next question was, well, what should I do? And, and then the answers to me were quite vague. They were, well, try yoga, uh, try this, try that. But there wasn't say, well, go to home base. Mm -hmm. you know, and, 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 and that would have been helpful, because then I, I could have gone to a website, I could, have, I could have had a list of all the different activities, who to contact, mm -hmm. and, and I could have done this in, in a couple of days rather than six months to a year. And of course, during that time, you become physically inactive, you gain weight, may, your, your physicality deteriorates as well, which is not helping your pain. Mm -hmm. And all because you have these uncertainties of how I should be moving forward with my pain. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the, the, one of the biggest uh, 
eye openings for me was this lack of coherency between, mm-hmm. you know, even the education courses that were available for people with pain and the next steps. So they should be they should be seamless. Mm-hmm. And I should be able to leave a course on how to manage my pain to the next day to find a place where I can do that. And so one was called the toolbox and that one should be the, the shit. And this is where I'm going to use my tools. And then we had nothing like that. And so that that was basically the idea. Uh, when we when we finally learned that we, we received the Movember grant, it was very exciting uh, and a little intimidating because, you know, to, to do this is, is a little bit different and, and but the, the the men who are working on this and our partners, uh, we have you know partners with the uh, you know the, Can- the Canadian and Quebec Pain Association. We have Concordia University's Perform Center. We have the YMCA is an amazing partner because mm-hmm. if this works the way we want it to, it can then be rolled out throughout Canada, mm-hmm. and then beyond, which was what, what Movember would like to do. So we have all the right partners at this point, and we're working very diligently with. The, uh, and I'm amazed by the commitment of our partners. They they're just wonderful. And they're just so, um, in, in, you know, they, they see the need immediately because everybody knows somebody in pain who is somewhat isolated or completely isolated. Mm-hmm. So it's not like we're, people are going, what? Isolated? What do you mean? Mm-hmm. Everybody knows somebody. Right. And these st- do you think the function of this program will only help people who are in chronic pain or also educate others about this? Well, I think it's going to help. I think it's going to help everybody because um, what we plan to do as well is to design learning modules, not only for people living with chronic pain, but also to help people learn from people with chronic pain. Because sometimes it's very difficult when you're, when you, you know, you, you become an expert on something to listen to somebody who's not an expert, but really has that lived experience of living with pain. And, and if you were to think about that qualitatively as data that you then interweave with your theoretical knowledge, mm-hmm. then you have a more holistic approach of how to be, talk, and engage people who are living with chronic pain. And I think that's what this hopefully we'll do. And, and we are designing, we will be designing courses, we'll be designing other things, not just for the men, but also for the people who look after them. You've talked about the Movember Foundation, who fund initiatives that are for men, uh, also around uh, preventing isolation and everything that comes with that. Is home base only for men? Well, it, 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 the idea of home base then is to have a focus on men, but we also have we also know that the programs that we're running, for example, for example at the YMCA, um, can be easily extrapolated to co-ed mm-hmm. ones as well. So we want to have we want to have a program that are for men, geared towards men, using a gender sensitivity around masculinity, mm-hmm. but also we're not going to exclude women. Um, the interesting thing is that if 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 a Y were to put up a notice saying that we have a pain class, it, it, and 100 people came, there would be 90 women and 10 men, mm-hmm. if that many. You know, so, so women tend to uh, seek out these things more than men do. So, that, mm-hmm. so it's not, it's not going to take anything away from women's programming. We're going to add to it, mm-hmm. but at the same time we're focusing in on men because that's who, who Movember funds. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so in, in order to honor that contract with them, that's where the emphasis is going to be on. Mm-hmm. But you know, everything we learn is transferable to women as well. Right. And and your story just so happened to be so personal that it came out of your own uh, personal story, which, uh, I mean, you're a man, so uh, it led you down this path, and this initiative can grow beyond the borders of yeah, and, and, uh, and gender. It, it's all that, and, and I think it's a, it's a really good example of how um, a researcher like myself who has a philosophically-based approach to things approaches uh, what people refer to as patient-orientated research mm-hmm. differently. So instead of building something and inviting people into it, we built it from the ground up and then sought out people who could help us. And that's a much different approach. And it was very interesting because everybody who we invited got very intrigued by it and, and actually listened more because they weren't coming in in order to be an expert in the context. They were there to learn from the men and what they needed. Why is that important not only for home base but also for the field that you work in? Why is that important well, to have people come in and listen to patients that have the lived experience? So right now, I mean, in, in the Canadian landscape of, uh, of funding, um, research teams are now having patient partners come in, and, and the patient partner is supposed to be the voice of the patient, but this is a little bit problematic uh, in, in some ways, based on what I said before, is that 
the patient is not a patient. They are a person with skills and, 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 and they have background that can be very helpful. But when you're a, you know, so I'll put it to you this way. We, we have interdisciplinary team and interprofessional. Being a patient is neither a profession or a discipline. So you're always on the outside. Mm -hmm. So we need to develop communities of care in which everybody has a place. And, and, and the idea of, of expert then becomes a diminished concept that people who are knowledgeable about something work together synergistically in order mm -hmm. to produce something bigger than themselves. So I always, I always prefer the idea of uh, I'm a pain perspective partner. I can give you my perspective on pain, but I'm not a patient right now. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's interesting because sometimes it's hard for people to get their head around that mm -hmm. because we, we want to you know, keep people separated rather than bring them together. And then it's not done in a way that is, 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 is purposeful. It's just it slips off the tongue better. Mm -hmm. All of this touches upon so many areas um, of human development, of personal development, such as identity. Um, we're talking about restoring uh, oneself, masculinity. There's something interesting that happens beneath the surface when we're talking about restoring. Um, because as you restored yourself, did you, th did you find yourself restoring also your own masculinity because of the pain? Yeah, I think what I think what happens is that pain is an incredibly humbling experience, and I think that during that humbling experience, you, you then realize you need to listen differently, you need to talk differently, you need to be with people differently, mm -hmm. and I think that was a huge transformation in my life because I thought I already was doing that well, and I realized that I still wore the the expert hat, and and that wasn't really helpful. What what people around me needed was for me to be Richard. Mm -hmm. to be somebody who listened well, somebody who listened more than they talked mm -hmm. and, and, and gave less advice but let people talk through their own. Because a lot of people know what they want to do. They just have it in their head and they need to talk it out in order for, it to, mm -hmm. for them to make sense of it. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's almost as though when you, you write something about yourself and you leave it for a few days and you read it, you go, yeah, that makes sense, That's, this, this, this is it. Mm -hmm. But if it just ruminates in your head, it, it, it doesn't, you can't bring it, it's less actionable than it is mm -hmm. if you're, if you have a chance to discuss it and, and to try things out. And of course, this is what Home Base was about too, was having these conversations with these men who all shared the same situation, their pain manifestation is quite different, but the same situation happens, that we needed something to help men before they slip into mm -hmm. depression, before they slip into loneliness and isolation. Mm -hmm. And of course the difference between isolation and solitude is solitude to me is a choice. So if I've had a very busy day around a lot of people and I want solitude, I'll go for a walk. Mm -hmm. But I know I can return to people. Isolation means I have very limited or no uh, contact. So there's always a bit of suffering associated with isolation. Mm -hmm. And isolation then is the thing that over time could lead to loneliness and loneliness then, as I mentioned before, is becoming a very significant risk factor for people's health. The support group that you attended uh, became a very transformative experience for you. Many of the participants in that support group are ambassadors mm -hmm. um, in home base and even hearing their stories and working with them, they have very inspirational um, journeys mm -hmm. through their pain. What has been the most inspiring for you about being in touch with uh, these other men? Yeah, I, I think that at first it was just watching them transform. Uh, you know, there used to be most of our most of the conversations were about pain and loss and inability to do things. And over time, as we met more and more frequently over a year now or over over a year, then it's changed. And the talk is now a little bit about pain, but more about life stuff. And in our last meeting, it was really inspirational. Two or three members who who basically hadn't really spoken up a whole lot, but were very significant contributors, talked about this transformative moment where they said, I'm going to beat pain today. Mm -hmm. And they went up and did something that they wanted to do for a long time and challenged their pain. And by doing that, they said, you know, I did it. I went home and I was tired and I was in a little bit of pain, but, you know, I felt so much better. Mm -hmm. and, and even though my pain's not, it, it may make my pain a little bit worse or it makes it a little bit better, but as a person, I feel better. And, mm -hmm. and that's worth it. Mm -hmm. And when I heard that, I, I, was, I was sort of inspired that this kind of approach really was one, in its simplicity, is mm -hmm. one that we need. I mean, I'm not saying we don't need the, 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 the therapeutic part that's professionally done for, mm -hmm. for certain things, but for a lot of people who are just trying to find their way again, mm -hmm. they, they need that buoyancy of others to help mm -hmm. them in between appointments or, or for the next time they meet with somebody. And, and, and the example I use is that 
if you see somebody on a, on a Thursday at 2 p.m. and you're going to see them again next Thursday at 2 p.m., what happens between those two days, that one mm-hmm. week, is the difference between healing and not healing. Mm-hmm. And if you just sort of spiral down during that week, and even if you have exercise to do and stuff like that and, and you haven't bought into it, you basically start over almost again at mm-hmm. the next week. And so what we're trying to do now is home base would, would, would catch you and they would give you something to do and support you. So then your next therapeutic session is going to be one where you, you haven't dropped down as much. Mm-hmm. And so you can, keep, you can progress hopefully a little bit quicker than that. Mm-hmm. But, but you always know that you know, home base is there for you. Right? So as this project really takes flight, now what is your greatest hope? My greatest hope, I think, is that we are able to reach hundreds, thousands of men worldwide who hear about us and go, I want to do that, and uh, I want to invite my, my friend, and we're going to go down and we're going to build some birdhouses. Or I want to go down and I want to try this class, because I really, I used to love doing this, and I, I feel too unsteady. So I want, to, I want to find the right exercises. I want to do this to build my confidence up again. I want some success. And I think, you know, there, in, in our lives, we, we kind of think about our large successes, our careers, our education, our, our, our any other thing like that. Uh, and really, at a certain point, it isn't the big ones, it's the little ones that keep you going. It's that first baby step, and you go, oh, okay, that's pretty good, I feel, I feel okay. You know, and then the next one, and the next one, and pretty soon you're going from baby steps to strides. And I think that's the metaphor I'd like people to remember, is that, you know, it all starts very small, but then mm-hmm. get yourself going, and, and don't, don't look back. And yeah, you may have flare-ups, and you may have setbacks, but they're temporary. You have to think about it, they're temporary. I'm going to take care of myself, my body's telling me something, and I'm going to listen to it, and I'm going to see who I need to see, but the first chance I get, I'm going to get back to not being isolated and seeing my friends and doing stuff. Mm-hmm. That's, that's the idea. Dr. Richard Hovey, thank you for your time today. Such a pleasure speaking to you, and we want to remind um, everyone that If you are interested or know somebody that could benefit from this program, you can go to www.homebasecommunity.com and sign up also for the newsletter to get more information and just go from there. So we cannot wait to see what will come about uh, for Homebase. Thank you, Valerie. Appreciate it.